strangers from the internet are standing outside. The strangers from the internet have come from far and wide. But I cannot receive them. I hardly believe in them. Hi, I'm Elena Richardson, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to Shadow Yaddo. This episode's theme is Artists on Animals, inspired by the need we're all feeling for some comfort in the midst of so many shoes dropping in the public arena. As we've largely been stuck at home, dog adoptions have skyrocketed. I'm guilty as charged. Our newest addition is Lincoln, the super doodle mutt. At dog runs, his name is frequently misheard and folks think it's linked in. Maybe it's my mask muddling enunciation. Maybe it's a comment on her cultural literacy. Anyway, spending time with her doggies, cats, chickens and whatever is the warm and fuzzy side of the equation. The other is our deepened awareness of the non-domesticated animals in our neighbourhood. Thanks to the world quieting down and our presence in one place 24-7, we're registering more. Foxes are showing up in backyards. Coyotes can be heard howling close by. Bears walk down suburban main streets. Of course, it's all the result of our endless encroachment on their habitats, our endless greed and need for more, more, more. We're scared of these wild creatures but more scared of the price of rebalancing our environment. I'm reminded of an idea I first came across in Samuel Johnson's writing. Perceived danger, he wrote, fear, has flipped back and forth over the centuries. At first, nature was terrifying. There were poisonous reptiles to avoid, ferocious beasts to fight off, swamps to swallow us up. So humans bandied together, building stockades and camps to effectively beat back such foes. Then, pestilence, crime, noise, overwhelmed communities, and wide open spaces seemed delightfully free and safe. The bucolic was born. Since then, we've bounced back and forth. Cities are slums, so we head for the fields. Then the countryside is awash in lime carrying deer, and we run back to skyscrapers. Now, the pendulum is firmly on the nature side, but those coyote howls remind us it won't last, or not for everyone. That's my surface understanding of how pastoral was born and continues to hold us in its romantic grip. But here's someone who actually knows a whole lot about the origins and significance of our fractured relationship with animals, farming, and big horizons. Listen in as the erudite, mesmerizing writer Brad Kessler, author of the novels Birds and Fall and Lick Creek, and the memoir Goat Song, gives us a primer on the allure of goats and how our global crisis has brought us back to the land. The sound you're hearing is milk hitting the pail. It's eight o'clock in the morning, early August in Sandgate, Vermont, at the home Brad shares with his wife, fellow Yaddo artist and photographer, Donna Ann McAdams. Okay, so you, so you're 
they're used to performing. Well, they do the one thing I notice when people talk about their animals is that everything about them changes, their affect changes. I mean, I know what happens with me. You know, if people talk, if people ask me about my work, you know, I've got this sort of dull mannered expression. But then when people talk about when when I'm asked to talk about my animals, I sort of light up and or about the cheese making process, because it's it's an art form like writing. But it has very little to do with my it has li- less to do with my skill and more to do with the, the fact of animal husbandry and milk and this amazing craft that's gone on for thousands and thousands of years. So we, we, when, we, when I started with goats, uh, I knew very little bit about the husbandry or the history of domestication and pastoralism. And it was only in the course of living with the goats and then researching this book that I discovered that the two things that I loved the most, which were animals and writing had this kind of ancient connection that goes back really to um, the Neolithic period when humans first domesticated goats. And there was a particular connection between song and poetry and herding. And so these were two things that I kind of stumbled upon. I mean, the writing I stumbled upon was just something that I wanted to do since I was a kid. And writing and poetry and song were things that I did intuitively. And then the goats came into my life and, uh, and herding came into my life. And when I started to do the research, I found all these, these uh, ancient connections, starting with the third century BC with Theocritus and um, the idols, and later the Georgics. So there's this whole tradition of, of uh, poets that wrote about herding animals, particularly goats and sheep. And that just seemed so odd to me. And so I, the, the deeper I looked the more I found that in pastoral cultures, there was this, this tradition of, of singing, singing to their animals, calling them in, and then creating poetry around it. So the book came out about 10 years ago, and we had friends, mostly friends who live in the city, in New York City or elsewhere, who, once the book came out, say it was 2010, 2011, they said, oh, you're, um, you're, you know, your book came out, are you done with the goats? Like, are you finished? You know? And we said, no, we're not finished. I mean, the, the goats are part of our life now. I mean, they feed us, and you know, they both physically feed us and nourish us. We, 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 we live off their milk and their cheese all year, year round. And I'm still discovering, to this day, there's, there's the longer you live with them, the, the deeper the connection gets and the more things that you discover about them and things that, that I hadn't known before. You know, you, you discover on year six or year 10. I guess what I'm saying is that it's, you continually learn from these animals and, and they're continually say, talking to you. And it's really our sort of monkey brains that don't listen, that we're used to. We're, we're used to speech. We're used to human speech. And we're used to that saying everything. But when we stop for a moment, stop talking and just listen, there's a lot going on. And there's so much going on with animals. It's a language. That's what's exciting to a writer, you know, is that here's a different kind of language. Since we evolved with ruminants, we evolved with animals as, as humans. We dreamt them, we, we herded them, we ate them, we hunted them. And so there is this connection that goes back again to sort of Mesopotamia. The most obvious way that this connection shows itself is in our alphabet, in the Roman letters A, C, H, and L, which their origins are Aleph, which is the ox. And if you take the capital letter A, and you spin it upside down, then you have its legs are the horns. Um, C, gimel, camel, is, is the word for camel. It's the pictograph for camel, and that's the hump of the C. 
H is is a gate, obviously. You know, it's got the two the cross piece and the two posts. Lamed is a kind of herding staff. So it goes like that where language down to its smallest units, its letters are related to herding. And then in Greek there's boustrophos, there's the the turn of the plow, the way the script was right as the turn of the plow. So there's all these little hints of animal herding embedded within our language. And that to me just that kind of blew me away that that these were two things that I was da- ended up doing daily was like turning the plow, you know, on the page, literally writing sentence after sentence after sentence. And then going out with these goats and walking with them in the woods and browsing. So they have their order. Do they know it by their name or their name? They, they do it by kind of hierarchy and they kind of establish it. It's sort of seniority. Huh. And whoever's in the alley is like the boss. <laughs> like Gandhi had this idea and it came from the Russians and I forget the, the man's name who had written a tract about this, but Tolstoy had championed it. But the idea was being that everyone, every member of society, of a culture, should spend some part of their day either growing their own food or making their own clothing. And if everyone did that, they would not only be more sort of grounded, but they would liberate themselves and the society from oppression or colonialism or a caste system that and Gandhi used this, you know, during the liberation of, of India as a, a way of talking about how they would liberate themselves from the tyranny of the English. They wouldn't rely on the, the, the English cotton mills. They, they, the whole trade system would change, and, the, and personally it would be liberating. You know the story about Gandhi, and he got sick, and his doctor said, you need animal protein, and he said, no, I don't believe in eating animal protein. And Kasturba, his wife, said well, what about goat? Can you have the goat milk of a goat? And he couldn't find a reason to argue out of that. And he started to milk a goat and drink goat milk. And then he had this goat that he hung out with for the rest of his life. He wrote a poem about it, actually. But there's something I feel like that needs to be said about the time we're living in now during COVID and how as everything gets quiet around us, as the earth, I mean, I just read how the earth literally uh, seismographically, the earth is getting quiet, that they can tell the difference between the noise that the actual earth is making, that humans are making the impact. You start, start to notice things more. And I think one thing you notice are the animals. And not only do they seem less timid as the world gets quieter. So there is this emerging animal life that I think it's, it's maybe one of the positive things that has come out of this crisis. So that intimacy that we've lost over time with the animals around us, and particularly the animals that feed us. When this book came out, you know, it's called Goat Song. Tragedy in Greek means goat song. Traga means goat, and oidos is song. So tragoidos, it's the, the song of the goat is, is where the word tragedy comes from. But if you've ever heard a Nubian goat screaming for your attention... <laughs> you could tell that it's the most tragic sounding thing in the world. This book came out, I think a year later, I was asked to write a forward for it. And I realized why, I, I didn't really have a clear reason why it was named Goat Song other than I liked the title. But the tragedy of it was that, that we've lost this connection that we used to have with the animals that fed us and how it's this great loss. And I think in, in this time, when people are adopting animals and are, are kind of reconnecting with the animal other, they're realizing what, what we've lost or they're, or, they're, or they're realizing what they're gaining by this intimacy. And the, the thing about the goats particularly that I like is that they seem to offer a window into that world of wildness. That they, yes, they are a domesticated animal. Yes, they are one of our oldest domesticated animals right after the dog. Yes, they've been living with us since the Neolithic but there's still something anarchic about them. There's still something wild about them. Um, they still have that sense of uh, autonomy that you don't get with dogs that have been, you know, domesticated, uh, or with, you know, you get it with cats because cats can be autonomous. But the thing about the goats is, you go out into that barn and you sense that they are a window into this, the animal other that is not just our domesticated selves and our domesticated animals, but, you know, the white-tailed deer out there, the coyotes, everything else that goes beyond that realm. So they do offer that connection. That's something that I 
wrote about in the book as being sort of the window to paradise is that once we connect with the animal other, we, we kind of see this lost world. And that relates to this whole idea of pastoral poetry is that it has this idea of, of, a, of a lost Eden, of a lost paradise from the very start, from the you know, Sumerian epics, that it was always like, well, there once was a world that was whole and now it's no longer there. And that whole world was when we were, were one with the other animal. That language hadn't severed us from, from that more ancient, silent language that we shared with animals. Brad Kessler's new novel, North, is forthcoming from Outlook Press. In part, the story draws from the experiences of a Burlington-based Somali community, with whom Brad shares a profound connection. Goats. Did you know that Sigmund Freud had a dog, a chow called Jaffe, who circled patients as they lay on the couch? Freud loved dogs and thought they had a calming effect on people. That's an idea that resonates with Christy Albano. Here she is on a strange encounter with Duke, the yellow dog. This seems hoodoo voodoo but I'll tell you a story about a dog and a ghost. I first came to Yaddo as a writer in 2014. At the time, I was homeless, having given up my job, my apartment, the life I'd built in New York City in pursuit of what I then deemed most important, time and headspace to write. I know I'm not alone in saying this, but Yaddo gave me a sense of home that I could carry with me. A few years later, I landed, so to speak, and began working full-time at Yaddo. Early on, I felt like a failure. I hadn't accomplished what I'd set out to finish, uh, the book namely. I also felt keenly the clear difference between being a guest at Yaddo and working on behalf of guests at Yaddo uh, some of whom had managed to write their books and keep their apartments. When Yaddo's program director, Candace Waite, retired, we had a launch party for her in the dining room of the mansion. It was the first time I'd been back in that room since I'd been a writer in residence. And I was feeling especially down that day, in part because Candace's leaving felt like such a huge loss. She had invited me here, after all. I had her invitation letter in my pocket in preparation for the toast I'd planned to give. But I also felt that I no longer belonged in that room. One, it was lunchtime, not evening, when um, Yaddo traditionally serves dinner. Two, the notion of not being an artist in a room meant for artists gave me vertigo, as if I were living in retrograde. The toasts for Candace began, and I felt a dog lean up against me. And I didn't think twice about it, given some of my coworkers brought their dogs to work. And I reached down to pet the dog, and my hand met empty air. Yet, I could still feel whatever it was leaning up against me. Just then, our head of housekeeping at the time, Lindia, who was sitting next to me at the table, got up to give her toast, and at the same time, the dog presence whipped away from me, and Lindia fell backwards over her chair. She was okay. I should mention, though, that Lindia was like the dog whisperer of our office, and that if there was a ghost dog in the room, and she was feeling upset, uh, it's a no-brainer that the ghost dog would ditch me for her. The point? The ghost dog made me feel better. He, and I think of him as a he, because the founders of Yaddo, the Trasks, had a dog named Duke. He claimed me like a voice from another world saying in a secret language, you belong. P.S. Candace Waite recently became a member of Yaddo's board. And in hindsight, during what I think of as my homeless period, I actually got a life. I met a guy and got a dog, who many of you have met. She comes to work with me. Her name is Pearl. Dog in winter, he's gonna come inside. Dog in winter, he's 
So, we know what Freud thought of dogs. How about the feline species? Well, he wrote bluntly to his friend, Arnold Zweig, I do not care for cats. In dream analysis, cats are said to symbolize our own inherent creativity, sexuality, jealousy, deceit, a link to the feminine side, an evil link between us and witchcraft. Okay, So at the risk of revealing more about myself than I mean to, I'll confess that on this one thing, I'm with Freud. I do not care for cats. A tumble of early memories probably holds the key to why. For now, let me just say that a Mediterranean island occupied by an army of feral cats is my notion of hell. But I do admit that there's wisdom in cats and a seductive energy at times. So we'll let the last word go to Mary Gateskill, the author of the story collections Bad Behaviour, Because They Wanted To and Don't Cry, as well as the novels The Mare, Veronica, and Two Girls, Fat and Thin. She's also written an essay collection, Somebody with a Little Hammer, and her most recent novella, This Is Pleasure, came out last fall. She had a cat dream of her own. And it's a good one. I once had an amazing dream. I'm not sure I can remember it exactly. It was after Gattino was lost, and I was in Italy a second time. And um, there was a Christian guy there. Uh, We were we had visited St. Francis's um, church. He was there, and he recorded for everybody a a, a talk on St. Francis, so we could you know listen to it while we were walking through. And I wore the headphones, but I didn't listen because I just wanted to look at the art. And so that night I dreamed that there was a wedding between two women and the person officiating was a woman with the face of a lion. And she wanted me to be part of the ceremony. And I said, well, okay, what do I have to do? And she said, I'm, I'm going to eat you. And I said, well, what do you mean like with your teeth? And she said, you will not be harmed. And I said, okay, and I had to be ritually, I had to have a shower and was ready for the ceremony. And then this Christian guy showed up and he was giving a long, boring talk about something or other sacred vows. And the women were just kind of tolerating him. It was only women. And then then the, my turn came and it's too lewd really to repeat in this context, but it wasn't a bad experience at all. And then I I was describing it at lunch the next day, and there was someone there visiting who was an Egyptologist, and she said, it sounds like you had a dream about Sekhmet. And Sekhmet is basically an Egyptian lion goddess. Thank you for tuning in. We thank our sponsors, including the Stewarts and Dake Family Gift. To the artists who contributed music, we're so grateful. Joseph Keckler, for his inspired adaptation of our theme music, Strangers from the Internet. The Kulning, or Herding Song, came from Danish composer and vocalist Mirkur, and the Wingdale Community Singers, featuring Hannah Marcus, Rick Moody, and David Grubbs, for their song, Dog in Winter. And composer Stephen Burke for his piece, Cradle Song. As ever, big thanks to our sound engineer, CJ DeGenro. If you have an animal, lucky you. Curl up with it, and we'll be back October 29th with more Shadow Yaddle. (laughs) 